There are a lot of factors that are responsible for the decline of oysters in Chesapeake Bay, but, but several are most important. The first one is the, the decline in water quality um, and also the over-exploitation of the population, the tremendous numbers of oysters that have been removed from the bay. And then thirdly, uh, we have two diseases that are affecting the oyster population that are not harmful to humans, but they are lethal to the oysters. The impact of the diseases specifically and then the, the decline of the oysters in general has been in very significant both economically and ecologically. Uh, ecologically, the oysters are a keystone species in the bay. They, they create a habitat for lots of other critters. They create reef structure. Uh, they filter the water. And um, on the economic side, the oyster industry in Chesapeake Bay was one of the most important economic engines um, for, for the region, and that has all but virtually collapsed. We have an effort here at Horn Point to uh, restore oysters, putting, put, I'm sorry, to put oyster spat back into several reef uh, river systems throughout the bay. Um, and we're trying to put them into areas that are not um, affected by disease. So we're trying to manage around the disease. MSX and Dermo live or tend to be most potent at higher salinities. Um, and so we're putting our oysters, which are disease free, in low salinity waters. One of the complications with that is that the higher sal the salinity, the better the oysters do in, um, for spawning. What we do here at the University of Maryland Horn Point Hatchery is we bring in adult oysters. We condition them using ambient water, which means it's directly from the Choptank River. And the oysters will eat that and put all of the energy into gonad production. And gonads either eggs or sperm. We will spawn those oysters, collect the gametes, eggs and sperm, fertilize them, and then put them in these big tanks for grow out. We grow them for about two weeks, and during that time, we take care of them. Uh, we grow cultured algae here, and we have different species, different types, and we will feed these tanks every single day for those 14 days. During that time, the larvae just grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger and start eating more and more and more, and eventually they will become eyed, or hot larvae, which have an eye spot and a foot. Technically, they're called petty villager larvae. Then what we can do is take those larvae out of this tank, introduce them into a setting tank where we provide shells for them, and they will attach to those shells. Once they attach, we call them spat, and then we can put them into the bay for our restoration activities. We've been producing over 200 million spat of, of oysters, spat on shell, a year in our oyster hatchery. This, uh, it, we need to be able to feed them. And while we could pump in chop tank water, and while there's a lot of algae in chop tank water, when you have, you know, billions of larvae to produce that many, you know, a couple hundred million spat, you need billions of larvae, you have a lot of mouths to feed. The algae that we culture for use in the oyster hatchery has been grown in hatcheries throughout the world. Uh, we typically use an isocrisis, either C iso or T iso are the common names for it. It's a very small flagellate, very easy for the oysters to eat. Uh, then we have a diatom, Velasia syra, which diatoms have silica in their cell wall, so they're a little bit chewier. So the larvae have to work a little bit harder in order to eat them, so they get a little bit more nutrition from them. So as the larvae grow, we give them different mixtures and different rations of these two algaes. Then we have our green stuff, which is a tetrasalmus. It's very high in fatty acids and lipids. So it's kind of like the dessert oyster, or a dessert algae. And we would feed this to them three to four days before they eye up, and that just kind of beefs them up and gets the larvae very healthy. So when they get ready to undergo their metamorphosis process, they're, with able, they're able to withstand the process and survive. In our greenhouse, this is where we mass produce algae cultures to feed the oysters. We start off with a sterile tank, which we use acid or bleach, and we can just clean up and sterilize the water. We'll neutralize it the following day, 12 to 24 hours later, and then we can take some of our big carboys and pour them into the tanks. We'll turn on the lights if we need them. We have a CO2 system that will regulate the pH and give them some nutrients, fertilizer. 
and within four or five days we'll have a nice dark healthy dense tank and then we can feed it to the oysters. In the hatchery we have over seven and a half miles of PVC pipe that has any flavor of water we could possibly want. We typically will grow the larvae using cartridge filtered water at one micron in size and we like to maintain temperatures between 25 and 30 degrees Celsius. So once we drain one of these tanks, we use this series of sieves and we use gravity and the sieve sizes to sort them. We are headed right now down to our beach setting facility where we have large setting tanks where we introduce the eyed larvae and they will attach and become spat. Eight of these containers will fit into each setting tank. And what we would do is put the containers in, fill it up with water, and then introduce the eyed larvae into it. Uh, we have some bubbles going, some oxygen. It's providing oxygen for the tank, but also water movement to make sure the larvae are evenly distributed. Then after about 48 hours of being introduced, we'll come back out, we'll take random samples, look at them underneath the dissecting scope, and look for spat. And if the spat are there, we can get an average count and know how well that tank set. The nursery area we use to grow the spat to a bigger size than what we could grow in the tank. Um, when we need spat at a certain size, we can simply lift them out of the containers or the shell bags and put them directly into the nursery and just let them sit out there and let Mother Nature feed them until they get bigger. We mark each pile with a buoy and it frees up the tank so we can clean it, refill it, and then set it all over again so we can maximize our production from here. We work very closely with the Waterman community uh, through a partnership called the Oyster Recovery Partnership, which uh, is a consortium of, uh, of Waterman, university scientists, federal uh, agencies, all working together to try to uh, move uh, the spat that we produce in an efficient way from here in Cambridge to various locations throughout the Bay. Uh, right now we're producing about uh, 95 to 99 percent of uh, all the hatchery raised oysters uh, in the Bay. What that equates to is basically, you know, tens of acres. What we had though in the Chesapeake were thousands of acres of oyster beds. So while we are very proud of the uh, hatchery uh, restoration work that we've been able to do, what we really need to do is fix some of the fundamental problems of the bay if we really expect oysters to come back in any sort of sizable population. Hi, I'm Brian Bastag. I'm the president of the DC Science Writers Association. And I'm out here on the Chop Tank River by the, uh, the bay, the Chesapeake Bay. And this is one of the many fun activities we do in the DC Science Writers Association. So if you're into science writing or science communication, I recommend you join our group at dcswa.org. <laughs>